Hello, 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 and welcome to It's All Good. I'm your host, Latavia, and back for another episode. And this week, I am excited to share that it won't just be me that you're listening to, but I have a very special guest, Vivian Williams, Esquire, um, also judge, host of As the Law Turns, um, owner of her own firm, actress, creator, all wonderful things. So Vivian, thank you for being here and welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Yes, I'm happy to have you. So for those of you who listen fairly regularly, you know that I start each episode with a grad, what I like to call a gratitude moment. For those of you who are listening for the first time, welcome. And one of the things as a part of me uh, doing this podcast is, and that I focus on is looking at the positive and finding ways to, you know, focusing on things to be grateful for, which is one of the reasons that I start each episode with a gratitude moment. So Vivian, as my guest, I give you the honor of going first, of just sharing with us someone, something that you're grateful for today. I found this very hard, largely because I am trying to be more intentionally grateful. Um, But I said, don't make it hard, make it easy. Go with the first person you think of. And of course, that's my mom. So I am grateful for my mom. Um, She is my cheerleader in everything, even things like, I'm like, I don't think I can do that. My mom's like, yeah, you can. And I'm like, she crazy. But but I love her blind faith in my abilities. Um, It makes me think of Venus Williams quote about her dad, that her dad brainwashed her into believing she was great. So, you know, my mom's still trying to brainwash me. She hadn't quite gotten there yet, but she keep, she keep putting it in there. So I'm very grateful to have a mom who's so supportive and who's, you know, always there for me when I need help and, and, and always there in my time of need. So that's what I'm grateful for. All right. Well, that's awesome. And thank you, mom, for being the cheerleader. Um, no, I, I get it. Cause my mom is the same way. Sometimes I'm like, Oh, okay. Uh, like just early in this week. <laughs> She was texting me like, hey, have you ever thought about this? Giving me topics for the, for the show. I was all like, oh, okay, well, thanks. I hadn't thought about it that way, but I will take that into consideration. So no, that's great. Thank you. You know, grateful to your mom as well. Um, when you said it was something, it was kind of difficult. I kind of struggle with this every week myself because like, oh, I don't want to keep saying the same thing. But there are... <laughs> I've I've realized, I guess, I just have some constants that I'm grateful for kind of every day. But um, today I am grateful for the fact that we finally have a African-American woman nominee for the Supreme Court. (laughs) And it's like, oh, it's right on the tail, right before Black History Month ends and kind of as we're about to enter into uh, Women's History Month. And I'll be honest, I do not keep up with who's who in terms of federal judges, but I saw the, I got the news alert today about, um, and I'm hopefully I pronounce her name correctly, Katanji Brown Jackson. If not, we're going to call her uh, Judge Jackson. Uh, but it's like on one hand, I'm kind of like, dang, why is this history? And why is this still a first? And we're in 2022, but at the same time, it's happening. I'm I'm happy. I'm grateful for that. And as an added bonus, I see that she has sister locks. So it's just like, it makes me a little more excited about that. And as excited as I am, I know that foolishness is going to ensue. Um, just, it, there's a democratic president. There's a nominee for the Supreme Court. It's going to be some foolishness. And on top of the fact, she is a black woman. Uh, so I was like, you know what, today I'm just going to enjoy this moment and we will deal with the foolishness that comes, that is sure to come. I will deal with that later. But for this now, for now, we're going to enjoy this moment. Uh, but like I said, as in thinking of her or this nomination, this historic moment, um, I felt like it was even more, I guess, kind of just great timing, knowing that you would be on the show today. Uh, it kind of made me, reminded me of your show. So uh, if you would just tell our, tell the listeners a little bit about who you are, um, as well as your, your show and your business. Um, my name is Vivian Williams, uh, Vivian Antoinette Williams, for those that know my whole name. And um, I am licensed to practice in the state of Florida. 
I do trademarks, copyrights, contracts, business formations for the state of Florida, and a little bit, a little bit of criminal defense still. <laughs> just a bitch and the show um that Latavia mentioned is called as the law turns I started it last year I was a former public defender and um I just I don't know I just sat down one day with my friends and I was like hey I think we need more representation visual representation of the five percent black attorneys that are in the United States. And so I said, let's see if we can make it fun. And I called up my judge who I actually stood in front of. She has actually sat on the bar, on the bench, I'm sorry, for 13 or so years. I've never sat on the bench, so I'm a TV judge. Um, and she, she was like, sure, I'll do it with you. So we talk about current events, fun events. We've talked about the Cardi B, Tasha K issue. We've talked about the gorilla glue incident. Um, we've talked about attorneys behaving badly. We had a segment on that. Um, it's it's been quite the run, and we do it live. So our audience talks with us, and they interact with us, and we read their comments, and then they help us decide whether we find a person guilty, not guilty, liable, not liable, um, or on roundtable talk days we just talk it out. So I'm I'm very excited to have the show. Um, it was very nice having Latavia on before. So thank you for coming on. Um, and right now, that's pretty much what I'm doing. Um, I opened a firm, Vivian Williams Law LLC, where I do the trademarks and everything. So come on, join me over there, guys. It's, it's been fun. We're on YouTube as well. So join us. Yes, yes. And as you mentioned, I well, first, I wanted to say you said you play a TV judge, but you are way more qualified than Steve Harvey. So we're just going to say that you're a judge because <laughs> I still don't and I have not watched it. So I cannot give any actual feedback. But if he can be a judge and have his own show, ma'am, you are more than a TV judge. OK, we're just we're going to claim that right here and right I'm now. Curious. Okay? I am curious, though, what he's going to be talking about. Is it just me that's curious about that? No, no. Oh, okay. I too am curious. Um, one of my friends said that they watched an episode and they said it was kind of okay, mm -hmm. but I just, I like Steve Harvey. I do. I think he's a great host, comedian. You know, he's done a lot of great things, but I just, I'm a big fan of staying in my lane and I encourage other people to stay in their lane. Um, so I don't know. And so maybe I should watch an episode so that I can actually say I've seen it and I know what it is and isn't about but I digress. Um, so you mentioned that part of the reason that you started the show was to kind of increase visual representation um, in terms of the five percent which I'll be honest when you shared that with me it was like I know it but I don't know it and I, I attribute some of that to the fact that I did go to an HBCU for for law school and majority of the attorneys that I know now are other Black people, <laughs> which, which granted, you know, as soon as you step outside of there, and, and the first time I went to court, it was like, mm, yeah, no, it's not just us, uh, especially, are you, are, are you, who are you here for? Oh, you're the attorney? Yes, I am. So get all of that. But it was, like I said, I love the fact that you kind of, that you all are highlighting that. Um, but I guess aside from wanting to showcase or give more visual representation, I guess, kind of what keeps you going in terms of doing that? Because uh, as we, we were talking before, just, you know, trying to st starting a business, building a business, as well as having a show and maintaining that, like, what is your, I know you had your initial why, but what keeps you going and kind of motivates you to continue doing all of the things that you're doing? I think it's that, and I know that may sound strange, but I think it's the fact that I still walk in the room and I'm sometimes the only one. Um, I'm still stopped by the bailiff as the defendant multiple times. Um, some bailiffs I've seen on multiple occasions. Um, I'm still, you know, looked at when I'm sitting in the attorney's box, like you're in the wrong place. And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm where I'm supposed to be. So I, I think that's the biggest thing that really keeps me going with it and being able to know that I am 
hosting or sharing a platform where I'm not the only one anymore, where we get to talk about the things that only we can really talk about, we, that we've expressed, that we felt, that we've understood. Um, other people can see it, but it's one thing to feel it, be a part of it and know it. And there's some, there's a heavy amount of joy in it, but then there's also the weird struggle. So I think it's kind of a fun play just to get us outside of our box, show people that legal is not so stuffy. Um, that's the other thing. I find that my mentees tend to think that because you're a lawyer, you have to be like really boring <laughs> or cookie cutter. Yeah. In that box. And I'm like, I'm not a box type. Um, <laughs> I missed that schooling, you know, I missed that day that they said, go be in the box. There have been times that I have been in the court that the judges have clearly laughed at me because they're like, okay, she just having fun. I, I didn't come here to be boring, sir. So, you know, I have legitimately said it. And yes, I'm about to announce this to people outside of the courtroom. Oh my goodness. I started off an argument once by saying to the judge, because I had nothing and he caught me by surprise. And it wasn't really supposed to be emotion or anything. It was just like a regular court day. And um, I'm like, well, judge, see what had happened was. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I just want to like show mentees that is okay. Like he didn't scold me. I didn't get a contempt for it. He laughed and he was like, okay, Ms. Williams. So it's just, it's, it brings a different breath a different air to the courtroom and um, that's what keeps me going with it no that's great and I love the fact that you that you did say that in court <laughs> uh, but I, like I, said, I know it wasn't planned and you know it goes against all the stuff that we're taught in terms of how to, the the formalities of being in court which quite frankly that is the formalities is one of the reasons that it's like I was like okay you know what maybe the courtroom or litigation is not for me, uh, but I've done it, but it's the formalities of it that oftentimes I'm like, you know, I could have said this without all of this pretext or this pretense. And so it's, I love to hear that you bring your full self to court um, because like you said, there's, I know for me, and I imagine you've heard something similar just growing up as a black woman, you know, the whole concept that we have to work twice as hard to get half as much and we don't get to be good. We don't get to think about it or make mistakes. We have to be on, we have to be excellent at all times. And so for me, I know it was like kind of figuring out that balance of, hey, how can I, you know, learning to, it's okay to be my full self in this space, even though this space was not you know, originally wasn't designed for me. Um, so I think, like I said, I love the fact that you are being your full self, that you are there in court. Although, like you said, sometimes you are holding it down by yourself. So we appreciate, I appreciate you on behalf of all the others. Um, but I guess kind of, if we go a little bit kind of rewinding a bit, like what was your motivation or reason for uh, joining this lovely legal profession? <laughs> I, I am, I think I'm one of the most unique perspectives when it comes to the legal profession. And the reason why I say that is because it, it just happened. <laughs> okay. I know that sounds ridiculous. Like everybody that a lot of other people that I know was like, oh, I wanted to do this since I was eight. And I was like, nah, I didn't want to do this. It was the one thing I didn't want to do. Like I literally sat down and was like, I am not going to be a lawyer or going to politics because it was such a negative connotation. And it still is, unfortunately. There still is such a negative connotation around being an attorney. You called a lawyer. If you're a public defender, you get called public pretender. Um, if you're a litigator, people think you talk too much or they think you're swindling them out of their money because you cost a lot of money. And I'm like, well, we do a lot of work. So <laughs> I, de I deserve this. So I, I, it didn't happen for me because I was planning it. It happened for me because my, my philosophy teacher said, you're pretty good in philosophy. And I was like, oh, okay. And he said, and people who are good in philosophy tend to do good in law. You might want to take the LSAT. Now, I was a humanities and political science major, so I had to choose something, you know, or I was going to be broke. Um, <laughs> I'm just saying. So when he said it, I was like, okay, we'll give it a try. 
I tried it and I tried law school and then I tried this and it just kind of happened. And I just kept saying, I'm gonna keep trying and see what happens. And um, God blessed, because I know it had to be him. And it must have been somewhere in his plan, even though it wasn't in mine, because it worked out. You know, how, you know, all the other things that I've been trying to figure out was just not happening. But this particular thing worked out. And here I am. Um, and I, I am now happy to be a part of it. I am glad I did it. I mean, the fight is still a fight. I'm not going to pretend like it's not. I have literally been called by a white male colleague, the double negative, being woman and Black. But yeah, I know. But the fight in and of itself is still is still beautiful. Well, yes, I I love it. The the, the I'm gonna try it. And no, the fact that you were a political science and humanities major, bam, you were you were setting yourself up for this. <laughs> I don't know if you realize, or maybe God was already setting it up. He just you know he, he had my like, mama. Yeah, they they had already come up with a plan. <laughs> like that reminds me one time my mom asked me, so what should I not? She was like, something about what is it that I wanted? She's like, so I know not, so I know what it's not to pray against. <laughs> oh, wait, you out here praying against things? But <laughs> yeah, so it's like your mom and God, they had a conversation and the plan came together. <laughs> you were just the last to know. Exactly. But it's like I said, it's lovely you're doing it. Um, and I was one of those ones that I knew, oh, I want to be a lawyer and made the mistake or maybe it wasn't a mistake, but I told my parents and told people about it. So it was kind of like, no, but you said you wanted to be, you've been doing, saying you wanted this since you were like, I get younger and younger every time you tell the story, but <laughs> so, so like you said, mine was a little opposite. I went to college knowing that I wanted to go to law school but I initially thought you know oh, I got a major in political science but thankfully one person I spoke to was like no you don't have to major in what you want to um, so I majored in communications well strategic communications which I fear about sophomore junior year I realized okay you're gonna definitely need to follow through with this plan or we're just gonna be out here trying to figure it out because like this sounds fancy but if we don't pursue a master's or something else you out here this is real broad so because it was like for I think my junior year I actually thought about like you know what I don't know maybe I don't want to do this or let me wait and then I interned at this company and I was like this is nice but no y'all want a little too much little did I know that like you said, law school and this this legal career was going to take a whole lot more but now that you I guess since you you know we went with the flow you tried it and you're continuing to try it um, and as you mentioned the legal profession still has a very negative uh, connotation and perception like I remember one of my friends when we were getting ready to graduate she's like okay yeah y'all some lawyers now y'all some lawyers and it's just like but but not me not me and so <laughs> I, I said, I don't know if you made a conscious decision to do this, but from what I know about you and seeing, I feel like you, you know, for one, he's like, hey, I'm breaking the mold. I don't fit into this box. But was it a conscious decision of like, hey, I'm going to do this. If I'm going to go through with this, I'm going to do it my way. Or is it just, did it just kind of happen? It, it happened again. It <laughs> No, because when I first started, um, I have a very big family, but I didn't really know too many people in law. And it just so happens that my mom had a good friend that she hadn't really kept in contact with who I was able to get in contact with, who's a, a pretty um, widely known lawyer down here. And mm -hmm. so that's kind of how I connected to figure out more about the legal profession. But before I was able to connect with him, I thought the same thing stuffy, boring. I had to change who I was. I couldn't be, you know, the, the fun kind of, I'm very talkative and sometimes a little loud. So I'm, I, I tried to tone myself down. I was a theater major for seven years. Um, I did acting on and off the stage. So what? There's no, toning, there's no toning that down. But Exactly. So I tried to pull back. I stopped doing theater. Um, I, I, I stopped doing the film stuff. I got rid of, I even got rid of like my tennis shoes because I used to be like the tennis shoe queen. Because oh, I was no. like, I have to be more, you know, this buttoned up professional. 
And somewhere along the line, I just felt saddened by it all. It just, I couldn't, I felt like I wasn't doing my best. And um, I felt like I couldn't do my best. And it was my first year being a public defender. I got thrown into the fire for real, for real, because they lost a few members. So I ended up having to go solo with no help, no training in, in a courtroom with a judge I never met by myself with like 200, 300 cases. And my colleague at that time, um, he said to me, look, I don't know what's going on with you, but you're gonna have to put your foot down. You're gonna have to grow a pair. You're gonna have to get yourself together because <laughs> he said, you can't keep letting them run over you. You have to be more direct. And I was just like, okay, okay. And then one of my judges was like, Miss Williams, you could be, you could stand to be a little bit more direct. So I was like, okay, okay. And I was like, you know what? It's just time to bring it. It's just, I sat down one day and it, I think I got comfortable because I had the pleasure of coming into contact at that time with the only um, sitting black female judge who is now my co-host, um, <laughs> Judge Dawn Fields. And she was fiery. And I had never seen a judge like that before. She, um, we were at first appearance and she's one of the longest judges. I still bother her about it to this day, but <laughs> she also was very like, I don't care if Joe, you know, Joe Dilly himself walked up in here. And I was like, well, she, you know what I'm saying? Like, she was like going in like on people and just being herself and not necessarily mean or, you know, the angry black woman, like they try to pin us, but just mm -hmm. saying, you know, the funny phrases, like I'm not boo-boo the fool, the stuff you hear all the time. And I was like, wait a minute, I can do this. <laughs> and... <laughs> The next thing I know, like I said, it really, it started with that moment where I was standing in front of the judge. I got caught off guard and it was funny enough. It was that moment where I said what had happened was all the black people smirked. <laughs> the bailiff <laughs> that was black in there smirked. You know what I'm saying? The clerks that happened to be, they was all like, the judge was clueless because I'm no, no offense to the judge. The judge is, is a white um, American. And they was like, okay. <laughs> But everybody else got it. And it just gave me such a sense of calm, oddly enough. It was like what I needed to kind of break it. And from then on, I was like, they about to get all this Vivian. <laughs> no, that like that's, I'm happy that you, I'm sorry that it took those different instances for you to get to that point. Cause I've been not in the sense of, uh, from a, from criminal defense, but I've been in positions where I got literally thrown into the fire. So I definitely understand that. And I, I got, I would say I heard similar messages. It's okay to be direct. It's okay. You're going to have, you know, it's okay for them to be, you know, for them to not like you a little bit or them to be a little concerned. Um, and so, like I said, I'm, I'm sure you did not care for it in the moment, but I imagine that you appreciate the lesson. <laughs> that you've learned and, and essentially kind of the strength that's come from, you know what, I can be myself, I can be my full self and it's okay. And guess what? They like me even more. They, you know, they respect me all the more because I'm being me. And I know from, like you said, in terms of just the legal profession, I feel like it's the, the, the gates or bars are opening a little bit but not much, but I remember even as, like you said, kind of that transition period of even from undergrad to law school, like, oh, I got to dress a little differently because very much a casual, I want to be comfortable. I will get dressed when it's, when I decide or it's warranted, but on a day to day, you want me in heels and a suit all the time? No, thank you. <laughs> so it was like, as I was getting closer to graduation, I remember like friends and family kept saying like, oh, okay, you know, cause I had gone, I had, uh, I decided to go natural while I was in law school. And so it was that whole, anytime I had an interview, you're going to get your hair pressed. You're going to do this. What are you going to do? And like, and I was still just feeling like, okay, I have to. So when I knew I had an interview coming up, okay, let me, can I get an appointment? Can you fit me in? Or let me do it myself. Um, or let me do a sew in. And, and to the point of just for even that part, like 
in hindsight, I realized how much of that part was like pressure for me of, of, of the conforming part of, well, no, well, you know, if you're doing this, then you need to look this way because that's what they expect. And it's for so long, it was like, we didn't really see or know of any options alternatives. So it was like, we had to. Um, and that was, like I said, for me, and it probably was in the first, within the first year of me practicing, like, cause I was going to court at that time. I was doing landlord tenant law. And so I was in court four to five days a week and after a while it was like okay this is I can't keep this up I just I'm not wearing a suit so I like as I was doing it because I was going to different counties um I was in North Carolina at the time and so eventually you know you, you learn which judge is which way which county is this so I figured out okay if I'm going to this county I know I need to have on a skirt and some stocking even though I don't want to even though I think it's stupid this is what they expect. And then there were other counties where I could, you know, address in a blazer or I could put on my, you know, pants, whatever. And so it was like during that first year kind of coming into my own of, okay, my voice. And this is how I lawyer. This is how I do this. Um, so I guess I say all that to say that as it, now that you have come into that in that realization and now having your own law firm, like how do you, I guess, what does that look like for you in terms of attracting or advocating for your clients like what does that look like now in terms of like hey I'm not the traditional attorney I thought I'll say it I'm I know it's you know I especially being that I work with trademarks and copyrights I get a chance to tell and I I said this to one of my clients I'm like guess what I'm a creative just like you you know, and it's fun to say that because they're like, oh, you get it. Oh, I get it on a completely different level than the other stuff suits. And I say that, you know, some of them are stuff suits. They like trademarks and copyrights because they like the, the writing and the, the transactional parts of it. Um, I'm still the litigator. I, I do trademark litigation. So there is that aspect, though, that they miss when they're not creative personalities. And I get to tell my clients that I get to be like, guess what? I have my own show. I started a magazine five years ago that, you know, um, mm -hmm. I was a theater major for seven years. I took dance until I was 14 as, as a ballerina. And they're like, what? And I'm like, see, so you're getting the lawyer with, you're getting the lawyer that's a lot like you. Exactly. And I think they like that. I think they enjoy that. Um, I think they like having that connection to me, knowing that when they sit down with me, I'm not just going to push them into this legal box and take away their dreams in that perspective, but I'm going to try to find some way to merge the law with their dream and their passion and what they're, what they love. So I like, I like being able to have that in my background. No, that's great. Cause I, like I said, you know, like, I think that that realization of like, Hey, I'm a person first. I'm a person. And these are the things that I love to do. I just so happen to be an attorney by trade or profession. Um, and I know, like I said, for me, that has been like, uh, I used to tell my friends, like, I don't have a lot of attorney friends because I'm not the typical attorney. And a lot of attorneys, you know, go to, they go to different events and constantly talk about what they do and that's their life. And so I am sure that, I know I appreciate when I encounter people who are, they present their full selves and not just what they do and what, you know, that they understand that what they do is not their identity. Mm -hmm. um, and so I know just on my, in my experience, I know that clients appreciate that. Like it is, I've had clients say, you know, it's a breath of fresh air. And so I am sure that they are smiling from ear to ear when they work with you or when they're, you know, after you have finished, whether it be representing them in court or on a, tra you know, a trademark application or trademark litigation, uh, which that can be a beast in of itself. Um, but so, yeah, I think it's great. But I guess outside of, you know, doing the show and, and building and running your law firm, like, what do you do for fun? Like, what keeps you sane and level <laughs> in this lovely, lovely world we're living in? I used to have fun before I started two businesses at the same time, but, <laughs> but, um, crazy enough, I like learning languages. Um, I spend a lot of time 
learning languages, I have said several times, and I'm going to keep saying it on every show in Tweety Duolingo <laughs> until they give me an ambassadorship. I have put okay. way too many people on their app because I have been on the app since about 2015. I wanted to kind of brush up on my Spanish again. Um, and so I got on that app and I've been telling people about it since when they're like, oh, I want to learn a new language. I'm like, I have just the app for you. And I'm not doing it because Duolingo's paying me. I'm doing it because they're actually a decent app. And because I love language learning, I have gone through several apps that I'm just like, ooh, no, ooh, that one didn't work. Um, and so I think I, my pastime is reading. I enjoy reading and learning new languages. So right now I am learning Mandarin Chinese. Ooh. and Korean so when you learn these languages you learn a lot about the culture um largely because the best way to learn a language too is to immerse yourself as much as you can so mm -hmm. I have become a slight addiction it's it's slight and and <laughs> maybe not so slight um <laughs> to K and C dramas Korean and Chinese dramas um I was literally watching one as I was getting dressed for the show today so <laughs> and um music I have really 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 gotten on to got seven lately um my it's a Korean pop group um that of seven seven gentlemen and I'm loving their music right now and learning Korean through some of their music so yeah language learning and reading would have to be my fave type things I tip my hat to you i have used duolingo as well i have fallen off so many times like at one point i had set the reminder and then it was like i guess they figured you know what we're not playing with her so we're not even gonna send you these we're gonna stop sending you these reminders because you're not doing it um but i i do want to learn spanish because it's ridiculous that i took it in high school and college and and then I was working somewhere where majority of my coworkers' first language was Spanish, as well as a lot of our clients. And so was getting I, at this point, I understand better than I speak. So I, I admire you for tackling two languages at one time. Oh, actually, it's really more like four or five, but those oh. are my, those are my hit targets. I decided to pull back on some of the others because I was like, you need to calm down. You're doing too much. Um, <laughs> But it was originally Korean, Italian, Mandarin, Chinese, Swahili, because I love the musicality of the language. Okay. Um, and, and uh, oh Lord, what was the other one? It was, it's been a lot of French, <laughs> Japanese. So it's just, I just, I actually knew some of these languages though, when I was younger. Um, my mom had a lot of international friends. And so I learned it kind of from them. But as I got older and I didn't have anybody to talk to, it got kind of weird talking to myself. So <laughs> people was like, you talk to yourself? Yeah. Like, no, I'm practicing, okay? Because one day this is going to come in handy. You just don't understand. Exactly. But unfortunately, I forgot the bulk of it. So I call myself kind of trying to re- a, a, you know reinvent re get get back into the, the the process but in the meantime also learned two new ones in Korean and Mandarin with two that I had never learned so um or had any contact with um so it, it's been pretty cool trying to learn them since the pandemic started okay no I I can only imagine because one is more than enough for me at one point I call myself I'm gonna try Spanish and French um because <laughs> It was like, I want to go. So do you, I guess uh, you mentioned, I learned a little Turkish when I was younger because my dad was in the military and we lived there. And so it was like, I was, I knew enough to be able to kind of navigate the day-to-day -day stuff because, but I was seven, seven or eight. And then, like you said, over time, it was like, mm, no one had, <laughs> when we moved people for one most didn't even know that it was country and was like where is that that whole thing so then it's only been in recent years I'm like oh yeah I know so it's like at this point I can still count to 20 and I can say hello and goodbye okay. um, because I've done like you kind of said like I practiced that much to myself but in terms of the languages you've learned like do you feel like so are we you know if we plan a trip are you our guide you're gonna you, you get us where we need to go do you feel comfortable <laughs> with that? Davis 
Duolingo has the ability to allow you to, you know, talk to other people. And I've been taking those forms. Like they do the Zooms where you can get on Zoom classes. Mm -hmm. But I still feel like I've been doing Mandarin now since the pandemic literally started back when everything closed down. So it's, I would say going on two years, I can say some good phrases, but when I get in front of people, it's like my mind goes blank and I get nervous and I'm just like, Ooh, so I don't know if I'm going to be a good to a guide. I can definitely, like you say, count to 10. Um, I can kind of order a little bit. Um, I know basic greetings. I can understand basic greetings, things of that nature, pretty decent conversations. I've gotten to the point where my brain does turn, have to turn off the Mandarin, if that makes sense. You know how when you're, when you're doing a language after a while, you start to think in the language and your brains mm -hmm. <laughs> always. And so <laughs> which one are we in right now? Which one, which, which switch? So I'll find myself talking to my mom and I'm like Shin Ma and she's like what and I'm like that's sorry it just, it just <laughs> or you know she's like well, do you want something and I want to say I don't know my brain will automatically say well would you doubt instead of saying I don't know and then I'll be like I'm sorry you don't know what that means so um hopefully my mom's eventually going to learn it by my consistency but <laughs> gonna learn it by default <laughs> like mom just try it you know how you had me just try those other things just just try it it, you, you never know you're gonna be you're gonna be in in china having a grand old time <laughs> she ain't trying to go she is not trying to go but yeah so i i'm really excited to 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 go to these countries in all honesty i do want to go um i know china a little upset with us right now we're not exactly excited with china um but i don't learn this language now so <laughs> So it's going to get used outside of this country. No, yeah, it's, it's quite a few folks that aren't too pleased with us right now as like, you know, there's a war going on or wars going on and political mm -hmm. unrest. Yes, yes. And we always want to be everybody's big brother, but not really. But that's a whole other, yeah um so you so in terms of the languages like I said I've been I would say I have my on again off again relationship with Spanish um have you considered doing any like immersion programs I mean I know you have all this time that you started two businesses and you just have plenty of time to take time off and go live somewhere else but <laughs> have you thought about uh like going somewhere to do an immersion program I've truly considered it multiple times to the point that I'm like, you you crazy. Um, yeah, I have, I, because I know that that's one of the best ways to learn it. Being around it consistently, force, being forced to do it because you have no choice. You cannot get food. You cannot pay for things. Right. You know what I'm saying? You can't, people looking at you like, Arr, and you're looking at it like, Arr, like and y'all just gonna stand there going, hmm? <laughs> no, it's not gonna happen. <laughs> so, I know that it would definitely help me. So it's definitely on my list of like things to do. Like I thought to myself, hmm, I wonder if I can get to like South Korea for a bit for like two months or so and just kind of immerse myself in the culture and see if I can learn Korean better that way. Because let me tell you, Korean is a little bit harder than it sounds. I, I don't doubt that because it all like, sounds difficult to me. When I first, okay, I'm a, I'm going to tell it myself, um, Korean got chosen because during, <laughs> you already laughing. You I, like, I, love, I love where it's going already. <laughs> Korean got chosen because during the pandemonium, that's what I call the pandemic, um, we couldn't, um, we, we weren't quite set up for the Zoom and all that stuff as swiftly as other counties. We were a smaller county. So we had a bit of a break, if that makes sense. Um, okay. And so I hadn't watched television in almost five years. I mean, law school happened. I started working. I'm an avid reader. So I would come home and read to put myself to sleep and just keep doing the day over and over again. 
And so I hadn't really watched a lot of television, literally in almost like five or six years. And I had no idea what anything was doing anymore. I was off of Grey's Anatomy. So I was just like, okay, let's, let's get on, let's get on my Netflix and see what it's like. Well, Netflix had too many choices. And so I was just like, I'm overwhelmed. So I put the remote down and I just walked off for a bit. I think I went to the restroom and I came back and it was on a Korean programming called, um, the nickname is called Chloe, but it's called Crash Landing on You. And I've never binged watched a show in my life, but I binged watched that show. And I was like, oh my God, I love the show. And I fell in love with the lead couple who are now dating and engaged. So they're like my chi- my Korean couple. Um, and I'm like, I got to learn Korean. So then I'm like, okay, I want to try. But then it, the, the real seal, the deal came when I watched another drama called um, Eternal King, um, Eternal Monarch. Um, I think I, I can't remember it right now. And I'm really mad. Um, Yi Min Ho. Um, was the lead character and he was like he was standing there and the music was playing he had on this like smooth suave velvet button down <laughs> <laughs> looking very kingly and <laughs> like the king he was in the movie <laughs> and he said Sarange. and I was like ah! <laughs> like I need to know what that Say it again. <laughs> I responded it. Them, this is, I can't believe I'm actually telling the story to people. Um, I rewinded it and I was like, what does that mean? And you know, when you when you're watching those, you have to have the words play at the bottom. So I had the words mm-hmm. playing at the bottom, and it means I love you in Korean. Sarangke, sarangke, or sarangke, I say. And I was like, okay, let me tell you this though. For those that like to say it it's not true I was not thinking he was saying it to me it was how he said it because I was like oh you just was thinking that man was saying that to you he is cute I'm not gonna take that away from him but <laughs> you say it to me I will receive it exactly but in that moment that's not really what my brain was thinking my brain was thinking oh wow I love the way that was just said you know how you hear something you just like oh, <laughs> or you hear music that just speaks to your soul I was like, mm-hmm. I'm learning Korean. That's it. Then, and, and that was the final straw. So I found my Duolingo app and I tried learning Korean. Um, mind you, Duolingo, you guys have gotten better with Korean, but you're still not great for people that don't speak a lick of it. I'm gonna just tell you. So I ended up having to go to other sources like YouTube um, and stuff <laughs> over time. YouTube University has definitively helped me. But yeah, when he did, I was like, uh. <laughs> so wait, what was the name of this show again? I need to go Trying look it up. Let, it's called, and I'm, you know what? It's the King, the King Eternal Monarch. That's the name of it. Ah. Eternal Monarch. Okay. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna, it's in I'm Korean. Add it in it's well, in. I don't have a lot of experience watching Korean shows. My first one, to my knowledge, was Squid Games. Okay, um, I never saw Squid Games. <laughs> I was told it's a little bit like Saw and I am very much like um, not into scary. It's, I'm not into scary. The scary, most of the scary movies I've seen was because it was someone's birthday and that was what they wanted to see. Um, like choice. in high school and college, that was, oh, you, you want to see this? Oh, okay. And then Jordan Peele had to go and start making scary movies and thrillers. So I feel somewhat obligated to go, That's but I've enjoyed it. I, felt, okay. I gotta support I gotta support but no um so Squid Games it's I guess I could see how someone could say it's similar to Saw in the sense of the the uh I don't even want to say goriness but just okay the, it is very vivid so, you know American shows it's like when we know something crazy about to happen they usually pan away uh this one it was like no let's zoom in (laughs) i want you to see all the details and if you're squeamish about blood then no and even the sound oh wow i'm not typically one to like scream or like look away or cover my face when watching something but the first couple episodes (laughs) 
<laughs> like I had the key. I literally was sitting there and I was like, oh, 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 wait, no, oh, wait, you're really, I'm you're sorry. really, really. Um, and the only reason I did was because my friends, a few of my friends like had watched it and it's like, no, 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 you, you'll like it. There's a good message, blah, blah. And I'm just like, where? I don't think it's going to happen. <laughs> But I, because I have this weird stubbornness of like, okay, if I say I'm gonna start something, I'm gonna do it. it. it, it, Even if it is as silly as watching a show. No, I want to see how this ends because I've invested this time and I'm the same way with books. I don't read as much for leisure since law school. I I say that law school kind of interfered with my joy of reading. (laughs) You're Unless not the first like, lawyer to say that. Right. Because I'm like, when I tell you, like, part of the reason I have these glasses right now is because I was the one who would sneak and read in the dark with a flashlight because I just, I love reading and I still enjoy it. But as you know, we do a lot of reading and writing throughout yeah. the day. And so, it's not the same. I agree. Yes. Yeah, so if it's now you give me a good fiction crime romance novel, I do not know why those speak to me so much, but <laughs> I think because they're easy. You know, they are, it's also like the, the nuance of the writers in terms of just some of them, they're very vivid. If you, as a matter of fact, there's a book called The Cartel. It's based in Florida. It's like one of those hood drama crime family ones, which I don't know why I seem to enjoy this stuff so much because I've never been a part of that life ever, <laughs> um, but I love it. And so like to the point of if it's, Oh, I want to read this book. I will, even if it was like starting right now, I will stay up until one, two in the morning to finish it or a show. Um, Cause it's like I said, this weird stubbornness. If I say I'm going to do it, then I'm going to do it. Even if it's just proving it to myself. <laughs> I know. But I feel like, yeah. So, so, okay. You definitely were traveling to Korea and or China or South yeah. Korea, so let me be specific. Yeah, you gotta be specific with them. <laughs> so what is, uh, I guess, if, since you are, your love of reading has not been tainted, what is, what are, what are you reading right now, if, if anything? It's funny you say that because it kind of started, it's kind of starting to now. Um, <laughs> I was literally sitting yeah, there the other day, like, uh, this need to be an audio book. I'm tired of reading I'm, or thinking to myself, would I even listen to it if it was an audio book? I was like, seriously, but I have gotten into the self-help books, the business books, mainly just because, you know, I'm, I'm in this new experience of my firm. Um, I love being able to talk to my clients and everything, but running a business is a new aspect for me. So I am doing mostly self-help books. Matter of fact, it's funny you say that I have a book literally right next to me. It's called the Infographic Guide for Entrepreneurs. Um, so, yeah, that's that's kind of what I've been reading. I think for leisure ish, <laughs> I've been reading sort of self help books. Um, my grandfather wrote a book called Journey to All Things, and yeah, it's talking about walking in your purpose and abundance and how you can live your best life. And I I love it. I'm reading it for the third time now. Um, and one of the other bishops in our denomination who's, um, who passed a few years ago, wrote another book called positive thinking changed my life. So I'm in the middle of that one, I guess as well. Um, so yeah, those mostly self-help books right now. I wish I could say I was reading something fun, but you like what you like. And if it's working for you, then that's all that matters. I have about, it's sad actually because I have at least seven books that I have started in the last few years, which somehow my stubbornness has not pushed through on those. Um, But it's like, and I appreciate them, but I, what I've realized is like a lot of times after the day, if what I'm reading is requiring my brain to continue to process, even if it is for myself, it's like, Oh no, mm -mm, exactly. I don't want it. I I don't want it. That's yeah. down and and so it's but I'm getting back into it and and like you said audiobooks uh I think the last one I feel like that I read all the way through well, it was an audiobook but it was Crash the Chatterbox um by Stephen Furtick uh but I've been doing I guess being more so reading a lot of like online articles kind of short like mm-hmm. let me get this in a quick digestible way but um but no but I love it and I'm 
gonna listen back so I can get the names of some of these books because you are you are motivating me and encouraging me to hey. get back in it. Hey, you know, like, go for it. I I mean, I'm with you though. I'm I was looking the other day and I said, I have way too many books that I'm like halfway done with, or I'm like five chapters away and I just can't bring myself to finish them right now. Um, and some of those are more fun books. Uh, one is called um, How to Be Black by oh. Oktandi. I can't say the name. Um, I know I could if I had the book in front of me, but um, then the others are still, once again, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, you know, the, the regular kind of entrepreneurship books. But outside of that, yeah. My grandfather's book's been a big book for me. I am plugging my granddad's book. Hey, it is what it is. You can Say visit. It's called The Journey to All Things. It's written by Apostle Dr. Gentle L. Gruber Sr. And you can pick up your copy at www.refugejax. That's J-A-X dot com. Um, so yeah. I'll I'll be sending you the link so you can get yours too. I was gonna say please do. And I'll include it in the show notes because I'm like, hmm, I I need to this as I am embracing this journey. I need to 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 uh, get some advice, some more advice. I take all that I can get. Um, but I no, just, so, so I say it like this: when people have things that you aspire to have, you should listen to what they got to say. You be like, oh, okay, okay, he got something I want. Okay, I see you. I see you, boo. <laughs> Let me listen and how can I be supportive in the meantime? Because I forget where I heard it, but it was essentially, you know, so into where you want to go. And so if it's, and even, you know, one of the things I took that is even for, as I now consider myself to be a bit of a creator or creative, uh, you know, who are the creatives or things, people that I enjoy, I aspire to what they're doing. So like, okay, how can I sell into that in the same way in terms of from a business standpoint, who are, the people who are, I would say, being about it and not just talking about it because there's all, I'm sure you know, a whole lot of people out here offering things or saying that they can give you this and guaranteeing things and just getting a whole bunch of money and not offering much of anything. Um, so I do appreciate that. And I appreciate you even more for taking the time to, to be here with me um, and to, to be a guest on the show. So I know we have plugged your grandfather's book, but where can people find you? And if they are wanting to watch the show, if they want to retain you or hire you as their legal counsel. So my website is V Williams with an S. I get that question a lot. Is it Williams with an S? Yes. Thewilliamslaw.com. You can go on my website and book a consultation. Um, those consultations can cover trademark issues, copyright issues, business formation issues, whatever it is. Yes, the cost of my consultation is factored into your business package. So whichever one you choose to do with me. Um, you can also find me on social media. I am on there quite a bit. I'm on quite a bit of platforms. I may be narrowing them down though. So you better catch me while I'm there. Um, I'm currently on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. And you can find the show every Thursday night. It is at 7 p.m. Eastern time. It's called As the Law Turns. I love the name, guys. It's called As the Law Turns. Uh, we are live, so you can talk to us and ask us live questions at that time. You can find us on YouTube and or Facebook. I know a lot of people don't have Facebook, so YouTube's another great hosting site. And, you know, come on over and join us on Thursday nights at 7 p.m. Eastern. Yes, East, remember, it's Eastern. So if you were in one of these other time zones, adjust yourself accordingly. Uh, <laughs> But it's a great show. Like I said, I watched a few episodes um, myself, and then I have, it was also great being uh, being on the show with you all. And I I love you and Judge Dawn. Uh, like it's just I love the the dynamic, the interaction. It is it is just like I can't help but smile while <laughs> while listening to you all and watch you all interact. Like it's it's great. Um, yeah. But like I said, so just in kind of thinking about your career thus far, life thus far, um, I guess, what is a lesson, 
like what would you say is kind of your biggest lesson thus far? Um, something we've already talked about. I'm still learning it. I admit it. Um, keeping myself outside of that box. Stop conforming or forcing myself to be something that's not me. Uh, learning that each person's unique to, unique perspective is what makes change, but also what makes the beauty. If we were all that cookie cutter version, it would be a boring world. So just kind of, you know, learning not to put myself in a box and, and to not put limitations on myself and or God and just moving forward. Amen and amen. Thank you all for listening because she, she said it perfectly. Um, just like she was, it's a journey. So remember whatever it looks like or feels like in the end, it's all working together for your good and take the limits off. And y'all enjoy yourselves. And so until next time, bye. bye.